I want to publicly thank the City of Brookfield for its cooperation in setting up this meeting and local law enforcement officials for their service this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, this is the 79th public meeting I've had since January. You probably know some of these meetings have been contentious, so I want to be sure to review the rules that we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment to exchange ideas. First, I'd like to ask you to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in Brookfield or surrounding communities. And then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional Districts. If additional time is available, I will call on those who do not reside in the 5th District. This portion of the meeting will last for about 1 hour and 20 minutes. I would like to introduce State Representative Rob Button, who represents a part of Brookfield in the State Assembly. He is here to listen to your comments and answer your questions about issues that are pending in the state legislature in Madison. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruption, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment that you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as we can within the time constraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. Let me repeat that. And if any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. And unfortunately, I had to do that when I was in West Dallas a couple of weeks ago. We all can disagree without becoming disagreeable. Signs are okay in this room as long as they are not disruptive or obstructive. The second portion of this meeting is devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they're experiencing with the federal government or seeking the help of Representative Hutton with problems they're experiencing with the state government. The way I know you would like to speak with me privately about those matters is if you indicate on the very bottom of the sign-in slip. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and it is not the time to continue discussions from the general issues part of the meeting. Any filming or recording of this part of the meeting is prohibited. And without any further ado, let me call up in the general issues part of the meeting Nancy Krajowski of High New Ryan and Brookfield. Uh, yeah, but speak up. Some people in the back of the room can hear you. <coughs> I'm a retired registered nurse, educated by the Daughters of Charity, Milwaukee, and a public health certification at UWM. My last employment was as a nurse case manager for the federal government. I'm very concerned about health issues and the causes and costs of disease. I'm here today as a member of the Citizens Climate Law to talk to you more. I have two asks for of you today. Number one. Will you commit to learn about and reflect on the effects of climate change that have resulted in increasing and devastating health issues, conditions? Instead of thinking about tons of carbon in the atmosphere, think about the severe health conditions that are being created and their ever-increasing costs. For example, 445 heart attacks and 278 people killed per year by the worst coal-fired power plant in America. Nationally, coal pollution alone has caused annually over 13,000 <clears throat> premature deaths, that's 36 deaths per day, 20,000 heart attacks, and 217,000 asthma attacks, with health care costs exceeding $100 billion. Of course, this is just one area of climate change concern. There's a lot more effects to reflect on, and a lot more areas where action is needed. Please read my book. 
Bloomberg at Carl Holmes' new book called Climate and Home for a positive view on what can be done. Ask number two, will you join and participate in the Climate Solutions Caucus in the House of Representatives? It was founded in 2016 as a group of bipartisan members who work together to achieve action on stopping climate change. It now has 40 members, including Mike Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin's Asian District. Its membership consists of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. One of the solutions it has considered is supported by ex-Secretary of State James Baker, George Schultz, and current Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. The mission of the Climate Solutions Caucus is to educate members on economically viable options to reduce climate risk and to explore bipartisan policy options that address the impacts, causes, and challenges of changing climate. I urge you to join this group in the House and become an active participant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that both the air and the water are much cleaner in the United States today than it was in 1970. And that's as a result of both economic forces as well as the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts and the enforcement the state and federal uh, agencies have done on those acts. I do not believe the Paris Accord was a good accord, and I agree with the President in pulling out of the Paris Accord. Uh, the reason for that is that there was uh, billions and maybe even trillions of dollars of uh, uh, assets and wealth that would be transferred from the United States and other first world countries like Canada and Japan to countries like China and India. The Paris Accord had us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 20 to 2025, while China and India could continue growing their greenhouse gas emissions uh, until after 2030. This is not a very good deal for the United States. And even if the Paris Climate Accord worked the way its proponents say it would work, it would only result in a reduction of less than two-tenths of one degree Celsius by the year 2100. So there was a lot of uh, jobs that would have been exported from the United States to China, you know, for something that was very minimal in terms of reducing uh, the temperature of the Earth. Now, I'll talk specifically about coal. Getting rid of coal-fired power plants will be devastating to Wisconsin. No. I was elected to uh, represent Wisconsin. We get over 50% of our electricity from coal-fired power plants. If they are all shut down, as the Obama administration wanted, we would see two things happen. One thing would be a huge increase in electric bills for consumers that would be devastating to consumers who are elderly and on fixed income. And secondly, it would increase the cost of electricity and energy to manufacturing. And manufacturing has always been one of the major employers in our state. Uh, one of the things that manufacturers look for and whether to locate <coughs> or expand plants anywhere is what the uh, cost of energy and what the cost of electricity is. Our electric cost per kilowatt on average is higher than any of our neighboring states. And if the coal-fired power plants ended up getting shut down, there would be good paying manufacturing jobs that would be leaving our state to other states in the neighborhood or maybe even as far away as China. Uh, I don't think that uh, the President Obama signed on to a very good deal that was particularly uh, 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 offensive to the people in the upper Midwest, uh, including us, that get our power from coal, and which has not been subsidized by the federal government, contrasted to either eastern or western states. Now, what I will also say is that Europe had a cap and trade, or I call it a cap and tax scheme, to fail. Their greenhouse gas emissions have been going up gradually, while ours have been going down. And the reason ours have been going down, and it has been economical to shift electric generating uh, from coal to natural gas. And the reason we are awash in national, natural gas is because of the hydraulic fracking that has been going on in places like North Dakota and elsewhere. 
So, you know, the answer to the question is, is that I think that people who are concerned about this issue, and I am one of them, made a huge mistake uh, in saying that the way that we would stop uh, emitting greenhouse gases is to raise the cost of greenhouse gases emissions in the United States. And then they made another mistake by having different strokes for different folks, where countries like China and India that are building coal plants as fast as they can, uh, uh, a get out of coal mail free card uh, while putting the clamps on our country. You know, I was represented, uh, I was elected to represent uh, the state of Wisconsin in the United States of America, not India or China. And I will continue speaking out against bad deals. Now, the president has said he will go back into negotiations uh, with other countries, you know, if they get off their kick of treating other countries better than ours and having a uniform thing for every country around the world. And, you know, I will not support a climate change deal that treats other countries more favorably than the United States and which hurts our economy and which has minimal reductions in temperature over a long period of time at a huge cost. Thank you. Jerry Malone, Ruby Lane in Brookfield. I want to thank you. Would you speak up please, Mr. Malone? Yes, I want to thank you for having these town hall meetings and uh, Senator Ted Cruz has the Muslim Brotherhood Terrorist Designation Act. It's in committee, I understand, and I wonder if you could give us an update as to whether that act will be passed. And it's in regards, to, uh, there is a goal of installing Sharia law in the American courts and society, and it's happening already in this country, in states like Minnesota and Michigan, and I want to see if we're, if we're doing anything on the federal level to stop well, uh, it's already been stopped. The First Amendment, you know, says Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion. You know, and that means that the civil court in the United States, whether it's a state court or a federal court, cannot impose a religious law, period. Uh, and, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if Muslims wish to subject themselves to Sharia law, you know, the religious courts can do that to people of their own religion, but the religious courts can't do that to people who do not adhere to the religion that the courts uh, uh, are having. You know, with respect to the Cruz bill, uh, that's in the Senate, uh, and I don't know uh, whether uh, Senator Grassley, who is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, has any uh, desire to take uh, the legislation up. And if it passes the Senate and comes over to the House of Representatives, uh, then is the time that representatives will look at it. So I guess what I can say in answer to your question, Mr. Malone, uh, you know, is that talk to the senators about that because they've got to vote on it and pass it first uh, before we get a crack at it. Laura Malone, same address. Good evening. Thank you for holding this town hall meeting. I really appreciate it. I understand there's some consideration of combining the health care bill and the tax reform bills so that you can meet the deadlines. Are you in favor of combining them? No. And why? <clears throat> two separate issues, uh, two separate constructs. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that, that the reconciliation process has been used for both of them uh, and it is, it is being used that way as a way to prevent a Senate filibuster. You know, as somebody who has served in the House, you know, during most of my political career, the one thing that prevents Congress from taking action is the filibuster rule of the Senate. We don't have that in the House. The House rules specifically prohibit the Speaker from recognizing anybody for more than an hour. And I think if the Senate you know, should, you know, get off the dime and go by majority rule rather than having a small minority or a 41 vote minority, you know, obstruct things. And I would say the same thing when the Democrats were in control of the Senate and the Republicans were filibustering. Thank you. And uh, to Representative Hutton, um, I'm interested in the UW free speech 
Bill, uh, can you give me any information about how that is coming along? Sure, that has been moving through the Joint Finance Committee. Uh, I know it is still being discussed as a part of the overall UW budget. Uh, I support the proposal that gives students free speech and think that we ought to be allowing those to be individual choices among students and families for the programs that they're paying for and that does represent the free speech. So I'll continue to encourage it amongst my colleagues. Thank you very much, Ed. Agree with you. Thank you. Susan Katkin, Cherokee Drive, Brookfield. for the Republican Trump health care bill, specifically because we worked on it without a CPO report. And what that has now told us is that 23 million people will be without insurance. That you did not have open and public meetings concerning this particular bill. Well, I had about that, 70 of them back <laughs> here that was discussed. Without trying to fix the ACA, prior to coming up with this bill that we know is going to be devastating to many people. Without guaranteeing that pre-existing conditions <coughs> must not be a cause of losing insurance, or that it will cause increased costs to individuals because of their pre-existing condition, and that the impact of your bill on senior or Medicare health care will be enormous. And I don't know if anyone wonder, understands it, but please explain how you could do this, knowing the damage it's going to cause. And also, why is the Senate trying to sneak through this bill without also having a CBO report or public hearings? Uh, and is this just your way of trying to get a big tax break to the rich? <laughs> the answer to that question is no. Now, first of all, there is nothing in the American Health Care Act, which is the Republican bill, that affects Medicare benefits at all. Period. Pre-existing conditions exclusions are prohibited in the Republican health care bill, period, no exceptions. And that is plainly in the bill. Now, okay, strike one. Now, what I, you know, what I can say is that you are already seeing Obamacare collapsing. Uh, there, no, I'm answering your question, okay. and I'm answering why I voted for the American Health Care Bill. Uh, we are seeing uh, all of the insurance carriers pulling out of certain rural and lightly populated areas. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the only insurer pulled out of 20 counties in Ohio. By the end of the month, if uh, an insurer pulls out of Iowa, only five of Iowa's 99 counties will have an insurer that will be selling individual policies under Obamacare. Uh, we're seeing it going down to one insurer in other rural parts of the country, including sparsely populated counties in northwestern Wisconsin. This trend will continue, and if we don't do anything about Obamacare and just let the present law run, Within 10 years, there will be 28 million Americans that will be left without insurance. And, uh, you know, I want to make a couple of other points. You know, in Wisconsin, the Obamacare in, uh, premiums have increased 93% since Obamacare was first marketed in 2013 and 2014. There are 115,000 Wisconsinites that did not buy insurance uh, due, even though there was a mandate and paid the fine to the IRS because they didn't have insurance. I would guess that most of those people didn't buy Obamacare insurance because it was too expensive. You see a lot of small business operators looking at the increase in premiums and also the increase in deductibles where it makes it unaffordable where they have to spend 
you know, a huge amount of money in premiums and deductibles before they can collect a dime under their insurance policies. And I was at a meeting yesterday with the vice president uh, where there was one Waukesha County small business operator uh, that said that between the premiums and the deductibles, he and his wife paid $29,000 out of pocket before they could file a claim and get any money back from the insurance companies. Now, you know, they were able to afford it and they've got this coverage. But I would submit that there are not really very many average Americans that will be able to afford high premiums plus high deductibles. And that's why they're simply deciding to run the risk of going without insurance, uh, and even though they have to pay a fine in the IRS. And the fines are much lower than the cost of the premiums plus the deductibles. So, you know, the economics are there uh, simply to pay the fine, even though I don't think it's very responsible to go without insurance. Now, this has got to be fixed. And it's got to be fixed yes. before things yes. get worse. And the Republicans have come up with a fix. The Democrats simply voted against everything. That was their choice. Uh, uh, we decided that it was our responsibility uh, to try to fix this. Uh, the vote that took place in the House of Representatives is the first vote on it. Uh, there will be a different Senate bill that will be uh, passed by the Senate and probably a third version of the bill when the Senate and the House meet in conference to reconcile their differences. But sitting back and saying, keep Obamacare, the ACA if you want to call it that, is going to result in the complete collapse of the Obamacare exchanges, which we are already seeing, and if we don't do anything in 10 years, there will be 28 million people that won't have access to insurance. May I just rebut some of what you're saying? Number one, the oh, Edna oh, CEO oh, said, well, that he was pulling out primarily because he knew the Trump administration yes. was not supporting yes. the insurance, not supporting it, which tells me that what you're doing is instead of actually fixing the ACA, you're literally trying to just let it die off, which as far as I'm concerned is really a sneaky aspect on the part of the Republican side. Yes. That's one. Well, oh, wait. First of all, it isn't sneaky. And anybody who says it's sneaky hasn't been listening. You know, Donald Trump ran on repealing and replacing Obamacare. Most Republican uh, senators and representatives for years, myself included, ran on repealing and replacing Obamacare. We are fulfilling the campaign promises that we made. The voters of this country elected a Republican Congress and elected Donald Trump as President of the United States. Elections have consequences. People who make promises during campaigns ought to fulfill them. The people who wanted to keep the ACA, and I would say that there are many people of very good will that wanted to keep the ACA, they lost the election. And as a result of losing the election, we're not going to turn back on promises that we made to the voters who elected us, and we are fulfilling those promises, period. I, I understand what you are claiming. However, the real issue here is people recognize that they need insurance. So why don't you go for a Medicare for All plan and stop messing around with it? Insurance companies to do these three things? 
charge older people more than five times what they charge young people for the same policy, to eliminate required coverage called essential health benefits that were required under the ACA, and three, charge more for or deny coverage to people who have pre-existing health conditions. Uh, I had heard that the law will allow states to apply for waivers. Uh, is that your understanding of the law? Uh, not, they can't apply for waiver for the five times uh, uh, increase. Now, Obamacare had a three times increase, right. so that's where that started. This increases it from three to five. There will be waivers that uh, can be applied for by states uh, on the other two issues that you have mentioned. Okay. Now, let me say this. Uh, what Obamacare said, said is they denied pre-existing conditions. So do we, you know. Uh, an insurance company cannot deny coverage for anybody that has pre-existing conditions. Period. No exceptions. And we've been very plain uh, in saying that. You know, however, uh, Obamacare, uh, you know, basically based uh, uh, their premiums on age uh, rather than anything else. And as a result, when people who have pre-existing conditions, you know, end up paying the same premiums, what it does is it raises the premiums for people who are younger, generally more healthy, and don't have any pre-existing conditions. And as a result of the increases that I've mentioned, 93% in a four-year period of time for people here in the state of Wisconsin, more and more folks can't afford it with the premiums and deductibles that I have described earlier. So what we Republicans have done is we have allowed states to set up high-risk pools. There will be a $108 billion annual subsidy from the federal government for high-risk pools. These are people who have expensive to treat pre-existing conditions. We had a high-risk pool in Wisconsin that ended up uh, 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 having to be disbanded uh, because Obamacare did not allow states to formulate and have their own high-risk pool. I can't say it was great insurance. There was no federal subsidy. There was no state subsidy. The insurance companies had to pool and kick in money uh, uh, to cover the high-risk people. So with the high-risk people uh, having a separate pool with a big federal subsidy that would be managed by each of the states like we did in a successful way of providing coverage for high-risk people, we will be able to reduce the cost of the lower and medium-risk people and as a result of that make it more affordable to the low and medium-risk uh, people. And this is to get at the 115,000 people who disobeyed the individual mandate, did not have health insurance, uh, did not check off the box on the tax return, and got fined by the IRS. Now, our bill gets rid of IRS-type fines, but it has guaranteed access to every American and everybody who's legally present in this country uh, uh, to insurance. Uh, and it would be up to them to decide whether or not to buy it. But the way we get people to buy it is by making it affordable. And when you're paying $15,000, $20,000, $29,000 out of pocket in premiums and deductibles before you can collect uh, a dime under your insurance, that's not affordable to many people in this country. And that's one of the reasons why you see these premiums going up because the low and medium risk people, you know, can't buy insurance. And any insurance program is one that spreads the risk, you know, whether it's fire insurance or car insurance or something like that. Well, the thing is, is the risk is being spread less and less. The premiums for uh, uh, everybody are, are going up. And that's why there should be some type of a segregation of the high-risk people with a big federal subsidy so that the premiums for the low and medium-risk people can be pulled down so that it can be affordable. So, getting back to my question, uh, so the, the law allows states to apply for waivers, but you're saying for the last two things like that, not the first about charging well, you know, you know, for example, you know, a waiver. If you, if you know, first of all, this doesn't apply to people who are on Medicare. Okay. Uh, you know, the Medicare benefits are there, and they have not been reduced under the AHCA. Yeah. I think we're talking about people who are between the ages 50 and 64. Exactly. Now, you know, 
Uh, you know, why should somebody have to pay for maternity benefits if they're past menopause? You know, it, it will end up lower, lowering their premium. You know, uh, why should a single man pay for maternity benefits? Uh, you know, they're not married, they're, they're not under a family policy. And you know, the way you lower the premiums is by tailoring insurance policies for risk that people have. And you know, which are, are you know are generally subjected to those types of people, rather than having a one size fits all plan. And Obamacare is a one size fits all plan, and it's becoming unaffordable uh, uh, for low and medium risk people and younger people. And they are simply violating the law, not uh, uh, getting insurance, and then being fined by the IRS. Thank you. Uh, Karita, is it Twain and Twain? Okay. Just, I'll just make one point on the, the health care. I do think if people are interested and if you're concerned, I would really look at the CBO analysis of what it's going to do because it gives you a very different picture than what we've heard here. So if you really are concerned about it, I would read it. Um, I guess my biggest concern actually is with Russia. I really feel very, very strongly that, especially with Comey's testimony last week, where he really laid out that it shouldn't matter what party you belong to, you keep bringing up the Republican Party, and I'll be very frank, because I've heard you say at a town hall that you care about, um, but you take an oath. I get that people take an oath, but taking an oath and a person's actions are simply two different things. And I would like to see you be one of the proponents because you do have a lot of stature within the Republican Party to say we need an independent commission. To me, what happened with Russia in our elections is no different than what happened on 9-11. I am extremely concerned about what's going to happen to us if we can't believe in our election process. And I just don't see people taking it seriously enough. And I don't know if it's because they don't understand how much damage you can do via computer. And so there's, you know, people aren't saying, oh, this is really a big concern. But I am really concerned. And I really feel strongly we have to put all of us have got to put the country above party on this issue in particular and say we need to have a solution and a guaranteed solution so that in 2018 when all of us are coming in here to vote that we absolutely can count on the fact that our vote will count and that we are not going to have somebody coming in here because while well, in the last election it hit one party it could hit a different party. I don't care which party it's hitting. What I'm concerned about is, I want to know my vote is counting. And I just truly don't think I have seen the level of concern by elected officials that I would have expected to see on this particular issue. Okay, first of all, you know, let me respond on the health care thing. Uh, the CBO, you know, has said there, there will be a number of people who will be uninsured if the AHCA passes. There also are econometric studies that I have referred to earlier, that there will be more people uninsured if Obamacare is not changed and the current law has left the run its course. As we're seeing, that insurance companies pull out of these changes uh, or uh, lightly populated areas only having one insurance provider and you need to have competition in order to keep the price down whether it's in health care or everything else. Now with respect to Russia, you know, I'm a Russia hard one. You know, what I can say is that, you know, they've been trying to meddle in our elections from Soviet times on. Uh, you know, they didn't like Carter uh, because Carter pulled out of the Moscow Olympics and had a grain farm. They didn't like Reagan, and you know they were kind of ginning up Senator Kennedy to 
uh, this uh, uh, assembled Reagan's run for a second term. They did try to uh, hack both the Republican and the Democratic National Committee's computers uh, during this election. We had better firewalls and stop them than they did. Uh, you know, and that, that's been published as well. Uh, what I can say is that Mr. Mueller, I think, is the one that is uh, uh, especially equipped to see if there were any criminal violations in this. And I want to see what his investigation comes up with uh, on that. If Congress establishes an independent commission, what's going to happen is that this will obstruct the Mueller poll for, the, the pro, for this reason. And that is, is that anybody who has potential criminal liability, who is subpoenaed by the independent commission, uh, will plead the Fifth Amendment or ask for and get immunity. If he's given immunity, then anything that Mueller comes up with cannot be used in the criminal trial of following indictment. So having an independent commission where they either have a parade of witnesses pleading the fifth, or on the other hand, getting the witnesses immunity, is going to tie Mueller's hands behind his back. Because the Fifth Amendment applies to everybody in its privilege against self-incrimination. Now, you know, the only thing that for sure that I was able to get out of Mueller's or, or Comey's testimony uh, last week is number one, he did say that the New York Times was publishing fake news. And I hope that they uh, get the message there because he said that in no uncertain terms. And the other thing, you know, that, uh, you know, he said was that he leaked memos to the New York Times through a Columbia law professor. Uh, that puts him in jeopardy, you know, as well, because the memos were government property, and you can't do that. Sir, Dr. Cohen, you are obstructing the vision of the person that uh, asked the question. Uh, now, you know, the final thing that, uh, you know, I would like to say about this is that, you know, I have an institutional memory. You know, I've been around there a while. And we had an Iran-Contra public investigation back in the late 1980s. And that committee gave immunity to Oliver North and John Poindexter. And they testified. The special prosecutor ended up um, uh, using immunized testimony in order to obtain a jury conviction. North and Poindexter appealed. The convictions were reversed by the appeals court because the immunized testimony was used. Now, if anybody wants to get people who broke the law in this entire episode, they have to let Mueller do their business, and they can't set up a commission uh, that uh, you know ends up being able to give immunity to witnesses and tie Mueller's hands behind his back. You know, and that's a pretty straightforward law. Now, a final point relative to Mr. Comey. Mr. Comey is kind of a victim of his own actions. If Mr. Comey had not publicly, and I have made my point before you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Comey had not said publicly in July that there was no evidence to uh, prosecute Hillary Clinton on the private server business, he never would have had to take it back with the two letters that he sent in October. Under Department of Justice rules, uh, announcements on whether or not to indict or not to indict someone who is under a criminal investigation is done not by the FBI, but by the Department of Justice officials meaning the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General, uh, you know, in this case, or by a U.S. Attorney in the district where it's been investigated. Comey started digging his own grave when he broke those rules and he announced it himself because he got the Republicans mad when he said that uh, uh, he hadn't found anything that indicated that Hillary Clinton had done anything criminal. And then he turned around and got the Democrats mad when he reopened the investigation as a result of 
uh, his investigation into Anthony Weiner sex did. Now, if he followed the procedure the first time, the second time wouldn't have been necessary, and Mrs. Clinton herself has said those two letters at the end of October was what cost her the election. I just would like to clarify something, because I, I think perhaps you misunderstood part of what I was saying. And just to be very clear, when I was talking about homing, what I was talking about was, I'm not talking about the criminal actions, I'm talking about the part where, just the part where he was talking about the attack on our election system. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm looking at that, and when I'm looking at an independent commission, being an attorney myself, I do understand the difference with criminal and how you have to be careful between the two of them, I get that completely. But what I'm trying to articulate is the fact that we could do an independent commission that focuses on the 2018 election and looking at what happened, what they were able to do, and ensuring that in our 2018 election, we don't have another power, I don't care if it's Russia, China, whomever, that then tries to come in and go after voter registration. That's what I'm referring to. Well, you know, you know, let you know, let me say there is no business that any other country has in mucking around with American elections, and there is no business that America has in mucking around in other countries' elections uh, on that. But you know, I don't know how you can predict what will or will not happen in 2018 if you don't go back and look at what happened in 2016, uh, you know, and build on that. Now, during the recount that the Green Party uh, uh, had uh, in Wisconsin, which was a statewide recount, it was looked into whether or not any Wisconsin voting machines uh, were hacked. And the answer, according to uh, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, is that it didn't happen anywhere. Uh, and, if, you know, the thing, the thing that I can say is, and, you know, I'm kind of familiar with how election, elections operate, is that the electronic voting machines, you know, which means where uh, you vote, you know, completely on a touch screen thing, you know, rather than the optical scanning ballots that we use uh, here in Waukesha County, uh, <coughs> that is not hooked up to the internet. It is hooked up to a self-contained system that is not hooked up to any other database or any other inter uh, or, or the internet. So the thing is, is that uh, uh, looking into that database will, you know, would accurately state what the votes were. Now, personally, you know, I think that uh, if your uh, municipality is using those kinds of systems, there ought to be some kind of a paper trail uh, on that, so that there can be an audit on paper rather than something that is uh, uh, entirely uh, 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 online or virtual. But that is something that the state legislatures would have to mandate, or the municipalities that are using them would have to go and get on their own. Uh, Margaret Redfern, uh, West National Avenue in the world. Yes, um, a few years ago at one of the town hall meetings, I asked about the voting rights act because you said we were going to, if it was the last thing you did, reinstate the part that was gutted. About two years ago, you said it was in the drafting stage. Where, where is it? Well, uh, Congressman John Lewis and I uh, introduced uh, the Voting Rights Act fix. And John Lewis is a civil rights icon. As a matter of fact, he's even called me Grove in a public hearing, which, you know, having a black civil rights leader talk about a white Republican from the suburbs, so I think is a, a very great compliment, and I appreciate him saying that. Uh, you know, as a result of what has happened, um, uh, we have to change our strategy. I am still committed, you know, to fixing uh, the case of Shelby County versus Alabama, uh, which gutted the enforcement mechanism of the Voting Rights Act. However, the current Attorney General of the United States used to be U.S. Senator from Alabama. And it's the Justice Department that ends up enforcing these laws. And it's the Justice Department, when there are bills relating to Justice Department issues, like this one is, uh, that has an inordinate amount of uh, influence in the White House. So, you know, the thing is, is I have to wait until I can go directly to the President uh, on this. And the President has his plate plenty full. But I haven't given up on, on this. You know, my commitment to the substance is the same, uh, but we have to go back to square
marijuana and tactics. No, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not giving up, you know, you know, the thing is, is I can introduce it with John Lewis, Bill's all ready to go, and Jefferson Beauregard Sessions will go up to the White House and say, kill this with a statement. Now, I don't want it killed, you know, I stand, you know, for allowing every qualified American voter to be able to cast their vote and to make it count. You know, the fact, the fact is, is that uh, with this selection of Sessions as Attorney General, uh, we have a great deal of difficulty. The thing is, is that the committee chairman that I serve under, Bob Goodlatte of Virginia, is also opposed to it. And I found out his 10 years as a committee chair, the committee chair sets the schedule of the committees. And, you know, what I need to do is to let things settle down a bit, if, well, people will let us do that, you know, and then figure out, you know, what can be done. But, you know, I'm not giving up. I, you know, uh, I made the deal to pass the extension in 82. I talked President Reagan out of vetoing it. I got it passed for 25 years in 06. Part of it was declared unconstitutional, and I'm uh, prepared to fix the unconstitutional part of it so that it can be an effective way of ensuring uh, people's votes. Now, what I can say is, is that, uh, uh, you know, under the current system, uh, there are going to be a lot of states and local governments that are going to find out that spending money fighting the Justice Department, which still has got the power to file what are called Section 2 suits as a result of intentional voting discrimination, is going to cost them a lot more money than having the pre-clearance conditions that were struck down by uh, the Supreme Court. What my bill does with John Lewis is to reconstitute those pre-clearance conditions, apply them nationwide, and to have a rolling system where if a jurisdiction does not have more than five violations, one of which has to be statewide, they can bail themselves out. And that's bailing themselves out for good behavior. If there are states that have never been covered by the Voting Rights Act that have more than five violations, they bail themselves in. Uh, so the complaint that we heard from the Southerners is why are you Yankees picking on us? Uh, uh, my answer to that is that this applies nationwide, and uh, this answer is one of the complaints that you've had, so put up or shut up. I, I understand what you're saying, but my point is, that all sounds really good, but it's going nowhere. It, it's uh, my, 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 my point is, is if I put it in now and pushed it, it would be killed. I would rather wait until uh, the time is propitious for me to be able to go around Mr. Goodlatte and get it scheduled, and you need to get it scheduled to get it passed, and to go to the White House directly and to get around Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, uh, and you know that's the time to do it. Right. And a lot, of, you know, the thing, the thing is, is that you know I've always believed that you never compromise your principles, and I have stated my principles repeatedly on that. But in order to be effective, you have to change your tactics to meet change situations. The situation has been very, very much changed. There's a way to do it, but you have to wait until I can sit down with the president and say this is the right thing to do and it's got to be done. I see. Well, I'm glad you're saying my principles, because actually that leads me to my next point. Um, because you stood by and said nothing and did nothing while this administration was vilifying immigrants and refugees. Stood by and said nothing when this president used a racial slur calling Senator Elizabeth Warren Pocahontas. Uh, you voted for throwing 23 million off of insurance, I and mean, I know you've gone through the insurance thing already. The only reason the HCA, and I think everyone would agree, yes, it needs fixing, but the only reason people Republicans keep saying, oh, it's collapsing, it's collapsing, is because the current administration has threatened to cut off those subsidies. And insurance companies
companies are afraid of that. Perhaps if we had health care instead of insurance industries run by lobbyists, we would be able to have people getting affordable health care. Medicare, single payer, works in every other industrialized nation on the face of this earth. No, it doesn't. Yes, yes, it does. It does. And we could have it here. Um, I also see you stand by You said nothing when the administration, when this president bragged about sexual assault and pussy grabbing. I didn't see you saying anything about that. Um, his family is financially benefiting from the office of the presidency. I didn't see you saying anything about that. My final word, I guess, is that, and by the way, the Paris Accord is for Earth. It's not United States versus China. It is for the entire Earth. And you know what? The U.S. is the second emitter of emissions. And we pay far less than other countries per citizen to help correct that. Anyway, the future is going to be in, in renewables. Um, anyway, I guess, you know, the world will move on with or without us. But what we're doing is giving up we our have place anything and else we're so that table. We can move on because some of this has been repetitive, ma'am. Oh, well, I, I thought the only repetitive part was, was the health care, which I, I admitted to. But yes, you can move on. Oh. Thank you. Richard Dierksmeyer, Davidson Road, Tom Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate your service and uh, the length that you've been in Congress, and I believe you've probably seen many, many CBO scorings on many, many bills. And I guess my question is, is there any reason to believe that the CBO scoring of the new Affordable Health Care Act would be any more accurate than the scoring of the Affordable Care Act. No. That's what and I said. they were pretty wrong on the scoring of the Affordable Care Act, both in terms of cost and coverage, when they got that score out in 2010 when Congress uh, passed the Affordable Care Act. The, the CBO scoring has probably been the most inaccurate predictions. You know, when you look at things down the long run on health care than practically on, on anything else. And you know, that's you know that's part of the concern. You know, uh, Obamacare is pricing itself out of the market. You know, 93 percent increase in Wisconsin. You know, in about four years, and that doesn't talk about the increase in deductibles. Uh, um, you know, sooner or later, you know, uh, most people, you know, who are small, lower, medium risk, simply aren't going to be able to afford health care, and we're going to see more than 115,000 people. Uh, uh, paying the fine because the fine is a lot less than the out-of-pocket cost of premiums plus deductibles of even the cheapest uh, policy that was offered under Obamacare. Is there any other method better than the CBO for guesstimating these bills? Well, you know, you know, there there are a lot of nonprofit uh, private econometric studies. You know, the question is who pays for them. Uh, because econometric studies usually reflect uh, uh, the answer that the financiers uh, wanted to do. And if the econometric study uh, comes back with an answer they don't like, we usually never hear about them. Uh, I, I have more faith in uh, econometric studies that are paid for by foundations and people that don't have access to grind. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Reese, St. Andrew Lane, Brookfield. Thank you. And I want to thank you for the uh, length and depth of your answers. Um, I appreciate that. And I want to mention that Mr. Logan brought uh, my concern, which is a security issue for our country. So I don't need to ask it. Thank you. Uh, Maureen Dayton, uh, is it Alvin or Anjo Alvo Lane in Brookfield? Alvin Lane, yes. Thanks, Representative. Uh, I've been a Wisconsin resident since 1975. I don't know how long you've been in Congress, but it seems to me you were around then, maybe not quite. I can't remember when you started. I voted for you in every election I've had the chance to vote for. I have raised five kids. I now have 11 grandkids, all live within about 10 minutes of here. I grew up not really very involved in politics. 
My mother voted Democrat. My parents were divorced. I grew up without a father. I never really started thinking about politics, I suppose, until I got old enough to vote. But then I didn't put a whole lot of thought in it. But I ended up marrying a gal who was from a conservative family. We've been married 44 years now. Great decision I made. Thankfully, she said yes. This is the second time I've been to one of your meetings. And I'm going to presume an answer. What I'm looking for in your answer, once I'm finished asking the question, and forgive me for the length, is a reason for hope. I'm 67 years old. I don't remember a time in my lifetime where there has been as much rancor among the citizenry of our country as there is today. There are people in this room that I know would not agree with me, and I most likely on a number of issues wouldn't agree with them. The thing that troubles me is, if we were able to push a button and all of a sudden make this the focal point of our country and basically say, people, we have just been given full responsibility for the United States of America and its place and role in the world and in its own country. We got both of those problems. Can, we, can, can this group of people spend time, interact, express concerns, figure out costs, look at cash flow and revenues, think about the tax element in our country, realize what there is and what there isn't, except $20 trillion of debt that my 11 grandchildren don't have no idea they're going to have to deal with. And I'd like to think there might be one or two or three or four or five people in this room that would share my concern. Maybe not for my 11 grandkids, but maybe you have grandkids. I mean, is there any hope, Jim, when we look to Washington, D.C., and we go through an election, and we vote, and we pick people, and they go to Washington, and look what they've done to us. Look at, the, look at how divided they've caused us to be. And it's not necessarily, can, isn't it possible? Isn't it possible for elected officials to get in a room together and say, look, we've got all kinds of people who have all kinds of ideas, wishes, and hopes, people who need health care, whatever it is. But we also have, everything costs money. The only reason we even are here today with the luxuries and comforts we have is because we've got $20 trillion of debt. We've got a federal government that can print money with no regard for its value. We can't keep going on like this. I don't want my children to attend the grandchildren. Maybe I'd ask the audience a question after Jim's response. Do you think we, given enough time, given the right information, the opportunity to educate, do you think you and I, all of you who've been raising all your red signs, I don't have a red sign, I'm not sure I'd raise it if I had one. Do you think we can work together and figure something out? Because yes. if we can't do it here, why do you expect they to do it in Washington? Yeah. Jim, is there a reason for hope? No. No. Sure there's a reason yes. for hope. You know, you, you look at the history of this country, you know, and it, it has a history uh, Putting, at least until now, putting past partisan divisions, putting the noses to the grindstone, and getting things done. Going back to Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, you know, which was a just war that was fought by the Union. You know, when you look at what happened during the Great Depression, which required, you know, a lot of reordering of our economy that was led by President Franklin Roosevelt. You look at us being woken up on Pearl Harbor, where we all got together and beat not only the Imperial Japanese, but the Nazis as well. Now, a lot of these problems are economic problems. You know, we are suffering from a division in uh, how we think that I think has been aided and embedded by cable news. And it used to be when I was growing up, we had three channels, maybe four channels. You know, now you can get a couple hundred of them, you know, if you want to sign up for them either on cable or uh, on satellite. And people watch the channels or listen to the radio with people they 
agree with, uh, rather than with people they disagree with. You find very few conservatives uh, that watch MSNBC. You see very few liberals that watch Fox News uh, on that. And, you know, what is frustrating to me, because I think it is my job to try to listen to both sides of the argument and figure out what's best for the country and best for Wisconsin, is that you have a lot of people that say, if you're not with us 110% of the time, then you're no good. Uh, and you have some of these groups, like MoveOn.org on the left, and uh, the Club for Growth on the right, that have now become the ideology police and are uh, going after Democrats or Republicans who are, quote, not sufficiently pure, according uh, to them. Now, I can say that one of the things that I'm proudest of is that there are only two of the current eight representatives and two senators that were viewed to be bipartisan by the Luger Center, the Cross Democrat, Ron Kind, and myself. But you listen to some of the opposition that I'm getting at a lot of these meetings, you know, it gets discouraging. Uh, and I guess there's no good deed that gets unpunished in this business. It goes with the territory and, you know, their challenges. And I guess I've got a big skin and hopefully not a hard heart. Now, what we need to do is to start being respectful of arguments that are on the other side. You don't have to agree with them, but you ought to be respectful of them. And if you listen to them, rather than hooting and hollering and doing whatever, you might be a more articulate spokesperson for your side of the argument. You know, and one of the things that I learned in law school, and I have practiced law for over 40 years, is that if you listen to what the lawyer on the other side said, you can be much more articulate in explaining your client's case to the jury. Now, we seem to be shutting off, you know, and uh, vigorously disagreeing with opinions that we don't agree with. That's got to be modulated. Otherwise, there isn't going to be any hope. And we can tear our country apart. Now, I've seen a lot of that in my previous 78 town meetings. I'm still going to do the town meetings. But I get, you know, the message is, you know, number one, be respectful of people on the other side. Number two, learn from what they have to say because we shouldn't be making decisions on what side shouts the lies. And third, do not call people's opinions a lie. People's opinions are opinions. When someone intentionally misstates a fact, that's a lie. But having a different opinion than you have to hold is not a lie and never will be. Thank you. Sabatsky of Pewaukee. That's me. Go ahead. He kind of stole my thunder there. A <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm a supporter of yours, Jim. I uh, and thousands and thousands of other people here in this area support you. Supported for you in every election that you've ever been in. And I'll continue to do the same as long as you run. One comment that I made, I would like to make is we talk about health care, talk about the climate change, uh, uh, the climate accord, the Paris Accord, getting out of it, there's talk about getting out of NATO. All those things were done because of the cost, because it's costing so much money. We have to, we have to be concerned with all these programs. What is it going to cost? What is it going to cost the taxpayers? We can't continue to borrow money, but print money, and we can't be the bank to the entire world. And they say raise taxes. Yeah, you can raise taxes. And they say raise taxes on the rich. That's private property. You're stealing private property. You can't do that. Jesus. What? So that's my comment. Uh, you know, you know let, let me respond to you two ways. You know, number one, I do not believe in getting out of NATO. NATO has kept the world out of a major war since the end of the Second World War. The problem is, and I've been at NATO meetings, and I've said that to foreign uh, members of parliament who come to visit me, is that the NATO treaty said that every country should pay 2% of their GDP to support NATO. Uh, 
in the year 2000, every NATO member was spending 2% of GDP. There are a lot of NATO members, Germany being the biggest defender, that are not paying the 2% of GDP. Germany is down to 1.3%, and much of that is done on the watch of Angela Merkel. Uh, now, after Brexit becomes official, there will be four countries who are not EU members, the US, the UK, Turkey, and Norway, that will be paying over 80% of the cost of defending continental Europe. That is wrong. You know, if this NATO is supposed to be collective defense, uh, then what, you know, everybody's going to have to kick in their fair share. The only countries besides the U.S., the U.K., and Turkey, and Norway that are paying 2% are the ones that have a direct border on Russia, the Baltic states and Poland. And there's a reason for that, and they know why. Now, Angela Merkel, you know, has said as a result of Trump's uh, exit from the Paris Accord that Europe is going to have to stand up for themselves. I agree with that. And Angela, if you're going to stand up for yourself, then you better pay up for yourself because you can't expect us to continue giving the defense of your country a free ride when you are not paying. One comment, Chip, because you said, is there any hope? Yeah. Give us big cars, good roads, cheap gas, and keep the stock market going. <laughs> Are you running for president? <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good platform. You know, this last election, both candidates were in their 70s. That's my age. Mm -hmm. And I said to my wife, I said, what would you do if I ran for president? She said, I'd call the mental health assistant. <laughs> well, in order for her to commit you, you have to be a danger to yourself or a danger to society. You may be a danger to society. <laughs> <laughs> Take care now. Uh, Maury Heagle of West National Avenue in the Berlin. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Lauder, please. Um, global warming comes with a big price tag for every country around the world. The 80% reduction of U.S. emissions that will be needed to lead international action to stop climate change may not come cheaply but the cost of failing to act will be much greater. Droughts, floods, wildfires, and hurricanes have already caused multi-billion dollar losses, and these extreme weather events will likely become more frequent and more devastating as the climate continues to change. Tourism, agriculture, and other weather dependent industries will be especially hit hard. But no one, no one will be exempt. Household budgets as well as business balance sheets will feel the impact of higher energy and water costs. I would like to report the estimates that the United States will pay as a result of four of the most serious impacts of global warming in a business as usual scenario. That is, if we do not take steps to push back against climate change. The global warming price tag in four impact areas are, by 2025, hurricane damages 10 billion, real estate losses 34 billion, <coughs> energy sector costs 20 billion, water costs 200 billion for a subtotal of those four by 2025 of 271 billion dollars. Continuing to deny climate change does not change the reality of it. I'm old enough to perhaps miss the full impact of it, perhaps you are too, but what about generations younger than we? My question, what are we all going to do, and particularly 
what steps have you taken to, uh, to assess and mitigate the looming impact of climate change? Well, first of all, the steps that we all ought to take, you know, is to get off this business of saying that raising energy prices is the way to solve climate change problems. Uh, raising energy prices costs jobs and it exports and outsources jobs to other countries. The second thing that we ought to do is to say that if we're going to have a worldwide uh, response to climate change, then every country has to be treated the same, rather than allowing China and India to do business as usual, keep on building coal-fired power plants, uh, you know, keep on burning um, you know, coal that doesn't have scrubbers and stuff like that that we have in our coal-fired power plants, you know, and then after 2030, uh, then they may decide if they are so inclined to do that uh, to start producing greenhouse gases. You know, my main objection to all of this from the Berlin Agreement of 1995 on to the Paris Climate Accord is that the United States uh, was labeled the bad guy on this and was required to reduce its greenhouse gases in a much more expensive manner while third world countries like China and India could continue building coal-fired power plants at will without any kind of reductions, either voluntarily or involuntarily. That's not a good deal. Donald Trump was elected in large part because of bad deals uh, like the trade deals as well as this one, which I think is the worst one at all of all. And I've said for over 15 years that if you want to get serious about climate change, you've got to treat every country the same, and you've got to not uh, zero out American workers, American rate payers, and the type of manufacturing base that we still have left in our country uh, for something that will have negligible, if any, uh, reductions in uh, uh, the, the temperature. And as I said earlier, and I'm repeating myself, if Paris worked the way that its supporters said it would have worked, there would have been a reduction in temperature by less than two-tenths of a degree Celsius by the year 2100. You know, uh, you know that's the facts that, that they had. Now look at the cost to America for something that isn't going to uh, make a difference of more than a, uh, uh, a fifth of a degree Celsius. You know, we've got to look at cost-benefit analyses, as the previous speaker said, and this one flunks it big time. Dick Glazer of Sleepy Hollow in Brookfield. Dick Glazer, thank you, Jim, for representing us for many years. Appreciate it. I'm 80 years old. I'm concerned with my grandkids. Myself and my kids, I think, will be fine. A couple of questions. In the Senate, if a senator is elected for one period, I believe he qualifies for full pension. No. Okay, correct me. No. Uh, members of Congress of both houses, you know, are, are treated the same as other federal employees for pension purposes. Uh, now, the Federal ERISA Act, which applies to everybody, says that everybody is vested with their pension after five years of working for the same employer. Meaning vested, meaning it can't be taken away. Uh, or what you paid into it, if you work for less than five years, it can be taken away. But if you work for more than five years, it can't. So the senators you know, end up uh, uh, getting vested, but they do not get full pension. Uh, the, the full pension occurs after, I think, 32 years. Yeah. How about salary? Uh, the salary, the salaries, you know, you know, are set basically by an act of Congress, and that's under the Constitution. Uh, there is an amendment that says that it cannot be raised without an intervening election. Uh, so uh, representatives can't raise their own pay, but if the succeeding Congress, after an election of representatives takes place, raises the pay then it applies to senators. I would point out that representatives and senators have not had either a raise in pay or a COLA since 2009. If the senator has one term, 
then it's not reelected. What part of the salary does he get? None. And, uh, you know, it, it, you know it, you're usually not eligible for a pension until at least age 62. Uh, so if a senator is over 62 when he leaves office, either voluntarily or involuntarily, you know, then he would get a pension, you know, based upon uh, how much was paid in, in the formula that exists in law. Why but it's the same thing, it's the same formula and the same pension system as a civilian employee of the Defense Department, a postal worker, you know, or any other federal civilian employee. The military pensions are different than the civilian ones. I think most people do not understand that. No, and there's not a truth meter on the internet either. Okay. <laughs> what about or all the members of Congress? Do they pay like the rest of us? Yes. Uh, since January 1st, 1984, uh, every member of Congress has paid a full Social Security and Medicare tax on their salary. Uh, prior to that, uh, 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 federal employees were exempt from Social Security payments. For members of Congress, federal judges, and presidential employees, there was no grandfather clause. For other federal civilian employees, there was a grandfather clause, but the new hires had to pay uh, Social Security taxes. But pre-1984, people with continuous service have not had to pay Social Security taxes. There are very few of them left. Thank you. As the gentleman already pointed out, we have $23 trillion in debt, which grows significantly under Obama. How are we going to get better? We're going to have to balance the budget and then start paying it off. And that's going to be tough work. I mean, you know, I would point out that uh, Obama almost doubled the national debt, which yeah. means that he almost uh, borrowed as much as his 43 predecessors combined. The How do you get away with that? Uh, sir, you're obstructing my vision of him. How did he get away with it? For, um, uh, uh, you know, ba you know, basically what happened is that you know there were accounting gimmicks that you know that were used uh, to prevent a direct vote in Congress and raise the debt ceiling. I predict one of those is in the near future. Uh, last question. <laughs> It'll come to me. I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Uh, John Trishenko, uh, South 168th Street in New Berlin. John? Thank you for taking me. Yep. I can't imagine that I'm here. This is only the second time I've seen you. I'm very hard of hearing. It's nice you have a mic. It would be nice one of these days if they had mics for the people in the audience to take care of people like me. I can hear you loud and clear. You can, but I can't hear them. That's the thing. My children bear with it. My wife screams at me. I don't want to scream at you. <laughs> oh, no, I don't mean. She gets irritated with, I'm never hearing anything. So I'm just bringing this as a point. In New Berlin, if I get this right, they don't have a mic for you. No. Here you got a mic, so I can kind of get your answers. But whatever they say here, okay, and I'm looking at this audience, much, and sir, I'm going to tell you right now that time. this audience is a senior citizen, primarily. What's your question? Because we're running out of you time. You want the question? Hey, you're not going to slam me on that, are you? <laughs> I said we'd go for an hour and 20 minutes. We're we had a party over here now. and a party over there that talked very long. I'm not going to talk long. I got two, two little things here. This is going to be a real easy for you, okay? With the GOP health care bill that passed the House, the part for basic coverage has the option if I got this right, correct me if I'm wrong, has the option for states to take a waiver. I answered that question I, yes. No, I'm not hearing you. I, I answered that question yes early in, uh, early in this session. 
Oh, you did. Now, I want to, let me finish the question. I don't know if it'll be exactly the same thing. That's why, see, I don't hear them. As the option for states to take a waiver so they don't have to cover hospitalization. That's the thing that struck me. No, that's not a waivable thing. Well, wait, let me finish. They don't have to cover hospitalization. How can you vote for this bill that allows state to opt out? That's the only first part of this. I think the, the health care bill that the House passed has a lot of problems. That's just my first question. The other one is, I'm amazed. I read the paper every day. I try to follow the news, and I don't okay, see any. What's the question, sir? Please. You want to? No, I want to just throw the second one in there. You throw the second one in because we're now an hour and twenty minutes. Okay, I was real quick. Is anybody concerned, like yourself, about the conflict of interest by the president? It stinks to me. There's something going on here, big time. I can't imagine a man that's a billionaire that from his office in the White House can see a property he owns. And his answer to one of the reporters was, isn't that great? Thank you. Yes. Well, the president will have to answer, you know, for himself on this. Uh, Pardon? The president will have to answer for himself on this. Uh, I do not presume to answer for him. I am under the ethics code, you know, that applies to members of Congress, and I comply with it. And it's now 8.20, and as I said, the first part of the meeting would last for an hour and 20 minutes. The second part of the meeting will be devoted to those of you who have got individual and personal problems with either a state agency or a federal agency. I would ask nobody who wants to talk about general issues.